Chapter 18 Gun to the Head Since I was now serving as adjutant of the commander of our battalion, Panzer Grenadier Regiment 192, I could for the first time truly take stock of and devote some time to only myself. Strained by the week-long reconnaissance missions, I had barely been able to get some rest. Feelings of exertion had become almost permanent and there had been hardly any chance to sleep. I was worn down, both physically and mentally. Several boils had formed on my feet as a consequence of me getting no chance to change clothes for several weeks. All the time since my involuntary excursion into the swamp at Montpinson, I had not gotten a single chance to wash myself properly. Caring for my soldiers had always left me as the last to find any rest. Even if I did not want to acknowledge it, I was, as a matter of fact, completely exhausted. Responses by my soldiers, who knew that I was willing to give everything for them, had helped me persevere and find the strength to go on. That was now over. All of a sudden there was no one left for whom I needed to care. An utterly unusual feeling. Time and again I would suddenly startle up in these days of relative calm, thinking that I had to check our positions or go look after my men. I was acquainted with my new battalion commander, Captain Reitzer, already since the rebuilding of 21, Panzer Division, back in 1943. The first time we had met was during the weeks of training at Versailles. Back then he had struck me as a very decent person, and in the time since then I had only heard good of him as well. Reitzer was known for caring for his subordinates with all his energy, and indeed he now gave me several days to recollect myself. I seized the time. After all, I did not know what my new adjutant position would require of me. Reitzer also confirmed that Rauch had submitted a request to transfer me to active officer duty, as well as promote me to first lieutenant by October 1st. Within the next few weeks, a positive response by higher authorities was to be expected. Around us, all German forces were busy re-establishing a continuous front line. After all, it was only a matter of time before a renewed powerful Allied offensive would follow. Considering this expected large-scale attack, defensive measures along the German border were stepped up. Back in the years 1938 to 1940, the so-called West Wall had been built from the Netherlands to the Swiss border. Along this 400-mile line stood over 18,000 bunkers, trenches, tank obstacles and other fortifications. On August 24, 1944, Hitler ordered the West Wall be reactivated in light of the rapid Allied advance. Among Allied soldiers, this German defensive line became known as the Siegfried Line. On October 1st, 1944, the Americans and French of Allied 15th Army Corps continued their offensive along the entire front line. If they were to capture the heights east of Rambovillas, then the entire Myrtha Valley would lie open before them. Army Group G thus gave the order to resist with utmost tenacity. 21. Panzer Division had to form another battle group and go on the attack again. To this end, my former second battalion of the Hunter 92nd Panzer Grenadiers, a company of Panzer Engineer Battalion 220, and a few tanks were assembled. These forces were to be readied at St. Barb, roughly five miles northeast of Rambovillas, to await the order to attack the town. The Americans and French pushed out of Rambovillas into the northeast in the morning of October 1st, 1944. Soon the units of our Shia battalion there were caught in intense fighting. It was now of vital importance to direct Tai'ai battalion's counter-push to the right location. The situation ahead of us was unclear, however, and we had already lost contact with one of our companies south of Manil sur belvite Thus, I went on my first mission as battalion adjutant on this October 1st of 1944. Together with a driver from the battalion staff, I was to reconnoitre the area in a camouflaged, formerly civilian Opel P4 automobile. Our main objective was to re-establish communications with 1st Lieutenant Heffele and his company. When the captain gave me these orders, I was immediately overcome by feelings of disquiet. Having to reconnoitre only with a driver in an enclosed, unarmed vehicle seemed like a suicide mission to me. 
we would have nothing to put up a fight against the enemy. On an open-topped Kubelwagen, there was at least the possibility of mounting a machine gun, but this Opel P4 did not have room for anything like that. But it could not be helped. Orders were orders. At any rate, I resolved to take my MP40 with me and keep one hand at the door handle for the entire ride. This would at least allow me to disembark quickly and defend myself appropriately in case of an unexpected encounter with the enemy. If we were to drive into the sights of a tank, it would be the end of the story. One hit by a tank gun shell would turn our vehicle into a ball of fire. Needless to say, we would not have the opportunity to disembark in that case. I signed off and we left the village of St. Barbe, where I, Battalion, had made its preparations, heading in the direction of the presumed front line. Without incidents, we passed through menil sur belvite where we encountered the last, most forward of our own forces in the area. These were a few individual soldiers in a handful of foxholes, with no heavy weapons and no anti-tank guns. The soldiers reported having no communications with the neighbouring company further south. First, Lieutenant Heffelet's Panzer Grenadier Company of almost 50 soldiers was supposed to be in a small patch of woodland directly between menil sur belvite and Rambavillas. We left the village and drove on a road between fields and meadows in a southwestern direction. Then the wide edge of a forest emerged in front of us, with our road leading straight into it. Roughly 1,700 feet in front of the forest, some combat engineers had worked to create a barricade. It consisted of several tree logs and had not yet been completely closed. This was a good sign. Slowly and carefully, we passed through the barricade with our car, and shortly thereafter, we were about to enter the forest. Ahead of us, to our right, there was a small dwelling house with a sawmill behind it. To the left was already dense forest. We kept going on the road until we suddenly, around 300 feet ahead and well camouflaged, saw several tanks standing at the edge of the forest. What? We don't have any panzers this far forward, I exclaimed loudly, realising in the same second that these were enemy tanks. The very next things I perceived were muzzle flashes from multiple machine guns and bullets hitting the road ahead of us. It seemed to me in that moment as if time was standing still. Without giving it any thought, I opened the car door with my right hand, and a moment later I was already hitting the road. Luckily for me, the driver had just hit the brakes, whether deliberately or from shock. Due to the remaining still high velocity of the car, I tumbled around, ending up lying on my stomach before rolling to the side in a flash. I could not sense any pain, and thus concluded that I had not broken any bones, and also had not been hit. I turned on my back, looked around, and immediately knew that I had no chance. To my right was completely open ground, and the roadside ditch next to me offered no cover to speak of as well. My driver had also escaped the car unharmed, and now we were both lying on the road. We could see that the forest ahead of us was just brimming with soldiers in olive-green US Army uniforms. We had driven directly into their guns like absolute beginners. Perhaps they had observed the road barricade from a safe distance. Some of the soldiers left the forest, running towards us, yelling loudly. I could discern from their calls that they had to be French. Before I knew it, and before I could even stand up, the soldiers were next to me. They stopped right in front of us, eyeing us with grim faces and without saying a word. I saw that they were entirely wearing US uniforms. Then, just a moment later, one of them stepped forward, bent over me, lifted his pistol, an American Colt M1911 as I discerned, which he then rammed into the side of my chest. With the muzzle aimed right at the iron cross I was wearing on my uniform jacket, he pulled the pistol back and again rammed it into my flank to hurt me. The man was only barely older than me, but I felt that he was full of anger. With fleeting eyes, he investigated my uniform, apparently to find out whether I belonged to the Heer, regular army, or the Waffen SS. Then I saw how his eyes got stuck on the lapels of my tanker jacket. He had spotted the two skulls fixed there to signify my allegiance to the Panzer forces. His look suddenly turned triumphant. He gripped the pistol more tightly, readied it, and pointed it towards my face slowly and deliberately. 
I was stunned, shocked, unable to utter even a single word. This is it, I thought. He is going to shoot me. I could clearly see the intention in his eyes. The soldier thought me to be a Waffen SS member, of that I was sure. The uniforms of Heer and Waffen SS were almost identical, with the Heer showing the German eagle on the chest while the Waffen SS had it on the upper sleeve. The skulls on my tanker jacket, however, seemed to be enough evidence for the French soldier that I belonged to the Waffen SS. In that moment I had to think about my brother, who, deployed as a tanker in Russia, had mentioned how the skulls on their uniforms had cost the lives of many after their capture. Normally I would wear the other jacket with braids on it, but today of all days I wore the one with skulls. It seemed to me as if the world around me was fading away. All I could see were the pistol's muzzle and the French soldier's finger which came to rest on the trigger. Suddenly it felt like there was a noise coming from somewhere far away. There was a loud yell. Halte! My field of view became wider again, and I saw how a hand was put on the soldier's arm. His arm was pushed down, and another hand gestured towards my left arm, along with the armband attached there, which showed two palm trees with the word Africa in big letters between them. Then I saw the person to which the new hands belonged. They came out of the sleeves of a uniform jacket, and judging by their cuffs, it seemed to be an officer's clothing. Perhaps a lieutenant like me. Apparently this young French officer had some objections about his soldier's intentions, talking to him loudly and insistently. Then the officer turned to the side and said something to another soldier, who indicated me to stand up. Once I was standing, the man suddenly spoke in German. Did you serve in Africa? the translator asked. Yes, I said and nodded. The Frenchman wanted to translate it back, but the officer already understood my nodding. He made his soldier translate another question. Where have you been deployed? he asked. In Libya, Egypt and Tunisia, I replied quickly without thinking. The French officer raised an eyebrow when I mentioned Tunisia. I continued without a pause, named the Marshal Foch barracks as well as the towns of Jadeda and Teburba. Now it's all about luck, I thought to myself and once again I was quite lucky. Just like that, the spell was broken. The officer grinned before talking to the other soldiers around, who acknowledged it with either a scowl on their face or no expression at all. Maybe this officer had served in Tunisia himself. Perhaps he had joined his comrades who had landed there. Many French soldiers had joined the ranks of General Leclerc's formations on their advance through Tunisia under the command of British Eighth Army in 1943. In any case, this young officer had apparently kept the German soldiers and possibly his own action in Tunisia in good memory. It saved my life. The officer finally said something to the soldier with a pistol in hand, who upon that stepped back, creasing his face sullenly. Then he suddenly stepped forward again, grabbed my iron cross with his hand and tore it from my uniform at one go. The French officer indicated us to follow him, and we walked the few yards to the nearby sawmill. When we arrived there, I was much surprised to see around 25 German prisoners already standing there. They were standing huddled together in a small shed which was open to one side. All of them had their hands up and looked into our direction, more or less frightened. The small firefight in their immediate vicinity had not left them without an impression. Upon coming closer, I saw more German soldiers, who had obviously been wounded, lying on the ground. Then I heard English-speaking voices and discovered a few soldiers to whom the American uniforms were better suited. One of them, an American surgeon or medic, tended to a German wounded, while three others were having a conversation. The French soldier who had pointed his gun at me now started frisking me. This he did not gingerly, simply throwing anything he pulled out of my pockets on the ground, only the belt with my holster and pistol inside he hung over his own shoulder. The French officer watched these proceedings attentively, and when the soldier finished his task, he said something else to him, apparently about my service book and wallet. After some back-and-forth argumentation, the soldier shoved both items towards me with the tip of his boot and a visible cuss on his lips. He indicated me to put them up. I complied without hesitation. 
After all, my wallet was where I kept important notes and some personal photographs. My driver was then frisked as well, and after we had both been processed this way, we were sent to join the ranks of the other prisoners. Now that I was not in the spotlight any more, I had some short time to contemplate what had just happened. I was now obviously a prisoner of war in custody of the Allied Free French. Prisoner of war? This would mean that the war is over for me, I thought. This thought would not stick in my head, however. I rather wanted to return to my side. Immediately I started looking for possible escape routes. The next moment I realised that another German officer was standing next to me, his hands raised. I recognised him at first glance. It was First Lieutenant Haeferle. I had seen his face during multiple briefings, and it was just him that I had been ordered to re-establish communications with. He greeted me in as friendly a way as the situation allowed for before explaining how he had been captured. The French had silently snuck up to his positions through the woods from one flank, and then, with a surprise assault, had rolled up his entire company from the side. An unknown number had been killed in the short but bloody fight, with the remaining almost thirty men ending up as prisoners. Resistance to the last would have been futile, and there had been no possibility of retreat. Their positions had lied directly in front of the sawmill, and so they had been brought here after their capture. I now told Haefeli that I had been sent to find him. Well, Hola, at least you have found us, he said with a sarcastic undertone. Only in that moment did I also spot a French civilian that had followed us up to the sawmill. This elder man now started wildly cursing at us in front of the gathered French soldiers, repeatedly spitting at Haefler and me. He shook his fist in a threatening manner and shouted triumphantly in the direction of the French soldiers near the road. The atmosphere around us grew increasingly more hostile. Haefeli whispered to me that he could understand everything, that these were apparently efforts to get us shot. Again I felt an incredibly heavy load on my shoulders. That my comrade was able to speak French, however, now paid its dividends. He shouted in the direction of the French officer and American soldiers, loudly complaining about the hostile sentiments uttered against us. This resulted in the officer hastily coming closer to our band of prisoners. All of a sudden, the characteristic howling of incoming artillery fire was heard, and moments later the first shell struck the road right in front of us. In an instant, the French were lying on the ground or ducking behind their vehicles. We prisoners wanted to lie down as well on the shed's floor, but the French indicated that we were to stay standing with our hands up, so that was how we witnessed the spectacle that followed. One by one, five or six shells impacted in the middle of the road. Shrapnel whizzed through the air, chunks of soil and rocks rained down on us. The French civilian that had cursed at us had not disappeared into the roadside ditch, but remained standing right on the road roughly 25 yards from Hughes, staggered and wide aid from shock. In that moment a shell struck right behind him, the man vanished in an explosion, and fractions of a second later his torn-up body was flung far up. A few yards away he came down again, now lying there motionless and mutilated beyond recognition. The artillery strike lasted for less than half a minute. Perhaps our side had noticed my vehicle being shot at, and rightly concluded that the French were already positioned at the sawmill near the forest's edge. As such, the bombardment of the French by our artillery had been ordered. After the last shell had exploded and no others were following, the French rose from the road ditch again. I saw that there were wounded, as some French were bending over their comrades and obviously screaming for a medic. Some of our soldiers now had quite frayed nerves. I saw some of them shaking violently, and all had pale faces. My heart was beating like crazy, and I was now expecting for the French to enact their vengeance on us. I feared they would open fire on us at any moment, but none of that happened. The French officer broke the silence by vigorously shouting a few orders. Then, around fifteen minutes after I had been captured, we were made to stand on the road in rows of three, and with our hands at the back of the head, we marched on the road into the forest. Hefele, his second in command, and I walked at the tip with the others, including our wounded, following behind. The Americans and the French officer were also following us.
After roughly a kilometre, we left the forest again and entered open terrain. Here, too, were long columns of American and French vehicles. After around a hundred yards of marching, a French soldier suddenly stepped out of the line that was standing at the roadside and threw a punch in my face with all his strength. It struck me completely by surprise, and with enough force that I had a short blackout. I tumbled on the ground and ended up lying on the road. Once again I expected that we would now come under fire, but all I heard was the voice of First Lieutenant Hayfell, who immediately started protesting in strongest terms in French. My lip was busted, blood ran from my nose. Our column had halted, and two of the other German prisoners helped me get back on my feet. French soldiers encircled us, and with loud shouting they apparently demanded that we were handed over, or perhaps even shot. Haifile stood firm, however, talking insistently to the French officer. Eventually the latter managed to put the French soldiers in their place and reorganise our column. In addition, this time a French NCO from our guards came through for us as well with a loud voice, imploring his comrades to let us be. Finally, we resumed marching. Still dazed from the punch, I stumbled along, taking a while to fully regain my senses. I had not expected to be treated like that as a prisoner. I was appalled. I had always done my best to treat my opponents correctly. Every time we had captured someone, they had been treated well. Not a single time had I witnessed any form of mistreatment. But of course, it had also happened on our side. This I would only learn after the war, however. We saw the town of Rambervillers ahead, towards which we kept on walking. After a short march between fields and meadows, we reached the town's outermost houses. There had been intense fighting here, as many of the houses were damaged. There were also signs of fires and several pillars of smoke rising from the town. Every place was full of American soldiers. I was, in fact, amazed by how many I saw. Military equipment was clustered all around, and it seemed as if in every single alley American soldiers were preparing for their coming attack. For me, personally, the war was now over. From that day on, I was a prisoner of war. Chapter 19 Poor Germany In Rambervillers, we were brought to the command post of an American infantry regiment which was located in a civilian home. The house had its own yard, which was enclosed by a man-high stone wall. We marched through the driveway and were directed into a corner of the yard. After that, our French guards left and a few American soldiers took over the watch. Behaving deliberately casual, their helmets not strapped on and slid back to their necks, as well as smoking cigarettes, they commenced their task. We were relieved to find that we were now entirely in custody of the Americans. They had, at least until now, displayed much less resentment and hostility towards us than most French soldiers. And indeed, soon after, several among us were gifted cigarettes. Once more, I found some time to think. I assessed that the reality of my capture had hit me hard and left me disillusioned. I really had not expected it. Time and again I had thought about what getting wounded or maimed might be like, or even finding a gruesome death. Becoming a prisoner was not a fate I had thought about, however, and now it had befallen me. In the American command post, things were busy. All the time soldiers came and went. American vehicles, mostly jeeps or dodge trucks, drove up. Jumping out of these were officers or messengers who then hastily entered the command post. One by one, every one of us was picked by a soldier and taken inside, starting with us officers. After Haifele and his second in command, it was my turn as well. I was taken into the house where the different rooms served as offices for individual sections of the regimental staff. I was brought to an American officer who, as I could discern from his insignia, had the rank of a captain. He began by asking in English for my name and the number on my identification tag. I answered, and while he was writing both down, I looked around a bit, I spotted a letter on which I managed to read that we were apparently at the command post of 157th Infantry Regiment, US 45th Infantry Division. I thought that the interrogation would now commence, but nothing happened. The American officer indicated that I could now go. 
As such, I left the house again with my guard. Outside, I asked Hafele what had happened to him, and he could confirm my observations as well as having had the same experience. Apparently, we were only here to be registered. Next, our wounded were carried off by an ambulance, leaving behind only those with minor injuries or none at all. The following hours we spent sitting in the yard, leaning against the stone wall and waiting. Nobody was really in the mood to talk. Everyone was absorbed in thought, perhaps thinking about home or the uncertain future that now awaited them. As for myself, I was still contemplating escape. Up to that point, I had always made it out, so why not now as well? The longer I kept looking around, however, the more hopeless such an attempt seemed to me. I would probably not have made it far. And even if I had managed to escape the Americans, the French would get me further out. What could happen to me if I was handed over to the Résistance I did not even want to imagine? What behaviour the French soldiers had shown towards us had already been more than enough. In the evening, eventually several trucks showed up, we were loaded in, and as it became dark, we set off in an unknown direction. After some time, we arrived at a town, which we identified as Epinal. Here, we halted on a large, open field, where a large number of captured German soldiers was already camped under the open sky. We were dismounted and looked for a place to sleep. Hafele and I had gotten along well from the first moment, and so we decided to stay together for as long as possible. There were no blankets available, and there was no food to be seen far and wide. Thus, I spent my first night in Allied war captivity, freezing and hungry on an open field. From the east we could hear the rumbling of the front, and everyone probably thought about our comrades who were lying there in the attacker's artillery fire. The following day, around noon, a young American officer approached, addressing us in fluid German. He demanded to see my service book. I handed it over, and he started to flip through, immediately noting that it had a bullet hole. This, of course, piqued his curiosity, and he asked about it. I responded by telling him about my action in Tunisia and the wounds I had suffered there. The officer kept on reading the service book, finding my home address. Österreich? Austria? he said inquiringly. I replied with a short, ja, yes, registering how he had used the original name for Austria and not that of Ostmark, which was in the book itself. The officer grinned, handing me back the service book. Then my comrades were briefly questioned as well before the American eventually sorted out five men, us three officers among them, signifying us to follow him. Again we boarded a truck and headed off. This time the ride took longer, and it was already dark when we reached a French town named saint Loup. Here we were brought to a large villa-like building inside a small park. Finding some orientation in the dark was difficult, but I tried to memorise as many details as possible while entering the house. We were led to the upper floor and assigned individual rooms. Within mine I found a cot, two military blankets, and several cans of food, some of them even with meat. The window had been covered up, and a single light bulb was hanging from the ceiling. Any other furnishing had been removed, I could still see where pieces of furniture had been standing by their outlines, leaving traces on the wallpaper. Upon looking at the cans, my mouth was already watering, but before I had time to get my teeth into this treasure, I was taken out and subjected to another registration procedure. This was carried out by two American officers, both of which spoke fluent German without any discernible accent. In addition to a simple registration, there were now first questions about my unit, the names of my superiors, our weapon and personnel strength, as well as our current mission and area of deployment. I had expected to be asked such questions and stated that I was not willing to answer them. Politely but firmly, I referred to the Geneva Convention and my rights as a prisoner of war. I was under no obligation to share any information which could be used to harm my own comrades. The Americans seemed to have expected this kind of response as well. Without hesitation, they told me that the war was lost for Germany and that it would only be a matter of time until we were to capitulate. There I butted in, defiantly stating that we would never surrender unconditionally and simply accept the same kind of humiliation as after the end of World War I. 
nobody would ever abandon themselves to that. The demand for unconditional surrender was the greatest obstacle to making peace, as it excluded any possibility of a negotiated solution, including an armistice. After that conclusion, I expected a reply, or at least another question. But nothing more was said. The discussion was over. The two officers called for a guard, who brought me back to my room. Before I was to enter it, the guard demanded my wristwatch. I was so perplexed that I handed it over without comment. Once inside the room, I felt to be in good heart. I thought myself to have done not too bad. Finally, I had some time to devote to these canid goods. After I had finished eating, I laid down on the cot and fell asleep immediately. But just as I had slipped away, I was ungently woken up again. I squinted at my American guard, which indicated me to follow him once more into the interrogation room, where I was again greeted by the two officers. They instantly started asking questions with the same composure as before. Their questions were also the same. Which unit, names of superiors, equipment and strength, current mission and area of deployment. Furthermore, I was told to report about my participation in the fighting in Normandy, about the Falaise pocket and about our redeployment to Alsace and Lorraine. I replied in the same way as the first time, but was still surprised by how accurately targeted these questions were being asked. To substantiate their inquiry, the two Americans had inserted multiple details about the units and formations deployed by our side, which, as far as I could tell, had to be correct. It was apparent that the intention was to make me believe that everything was already known and that my information would only serve as final confirmation. I did not want to fall for that trick, however, so I replied not by answering any questions, but by elaborately complaining about the way in which I had been captured by the French. I described how we ourselves had treated our prisoners, and then questioned whether or not adequate treatment by the Allied side could be expected. It seemed to me as if this had, for the first time, broken through the two officers' reserve for a bit. Already a little annoyed, but still unemotional and composed, they let me know that if I was to not cooperate right now, I could be handed over back to the French at once, and that, unfortunately, there would be no responsibility taken for whatever happened to me there. Perhaps I would even be sent to Africa to do harsh labour in the desert. Defiantly, I replied that I had been to Africa twice already, and that I would weather my third deployment there just as well. I was not at all willing to endanger the lives of my comrades through my testimony, still invoking the rights granted to me by the Geneva Convention. According to it, I, as a prisoner of war, only had to state my full name, date of birth, military rank and identification number. Nothing else. After that statement, this second interrogation was concluded, and I was brought back to my room. When I returned there, I found that the remaining cans of food were missing. What now followed were several days of repeated interrogations, always following the same pattern. The same questions were being asked time and again, with others being added in. For example, they even wanted to know the name of the local NSDAP leader in my home village of Potschach. I continued to remain unyielding, which in turn had consequences for me. Although I was still given food in irregular intervals, my room was stripped of what little commodities were left one by one. At first, the cot disappeared, then the light remained on at all times. Eventually, I was only left with a single blanket, and when I became tired, the interrogations were conducted in ever shorter intervals. Each time I came back to my room, I would quickly fall asleep, was woken up soon after, and the whole thing started over. This way I slowly lost my sense of time. My other comrades I would see not even once. After some sessions of questioning, a new method of interrogation was added in. Now I was being told of atrocities committed by German troops during the invasion of Poland, deportations of dissenters by the Gestapo, German secret police, and finally the organised hunt for all Jews within Germany and any occupied regions. These reports were completely new to me. They seemed utterly implausible. I thought them to be pure propaganda, smiling pityingly at the Americans, shaking my head and not reacting to them any further. 
I had absolutely no clue. I dismissed it all as nonsensical talk and continued referring to the Geneva Convention and my rights. When I think today about what the Americans already knew back at that time and I, on the other hand, knew not, I have to shake my head in regret. How naive have I and so many others been? Even more, the very atrocities that these two Americans were already confronting me with in October of 1944 still paled in comparison to the horrors that the Allies would discover on their advance into Germany in early 1945. I then, in turn, held Allied bombing attacks against the Americans. The death of women and children who perished in the firestorms caused by incendiary bombs. At that time, I was still convinced that we were not the ones to commit atrocities at a grand scale, but rather the Allies. In these hour-long interrogation sessions, during which I remained stubborn and persistent, there was certainly an assessment compiled of me, which described me as obstinate and arrogant, meaning a typically German officer, just like our opponent's conception of a German officer had to be. Tough on himself, unwilling to cooperate, despicable, inveterate, fanatical. An assessment made by these interrogation officers that would be of significance for my future treatment. After I had been interrogated around a dozen times, this phase ended just as well. As usual, the guard came to take me to the interrogation room. When I arrived at the American officers and they surprisingly gave me back my watch, however, I knew that it was now over. I looked at the face to read the time and date, finding out that it was now October 6th, 1944. So I had been continuously interrogated for more than three whole days. All five of us, meaning the men that had been brought here together three days ago, were now assembled in front of the building. We looked each other in the eyes. Everyone was tired, their expressions showing little more than exhaustion. After a short while, we were put into a truck and taken back to the outdoor camp. On the ride, we talked a few words. Each said that they had been treated the same way I had been, claiming to have remained unwavering during their interrogations. As we were all completely overtired and exhausted, our conversation soon ended. The remaining ride to the outdoor camp we spent sleeping. Once arrived at the camp, we were split into groups right after leaving the vehicle. Word was that we were to be transported off by rail. From the hundreds of prisoners, columns were formed and one after the other marched to a nearby train station. A long freight train was standing ready, consisting of individual cattle cars. While the lower ranks and non-commissioned officers were loaded into the train cars together, US officers were segregated. A little while later, we were around 20 officers of varying ranks. A group of five immediately separated themselves from the rest of us, letting us know that they did not want to have anything to do with us. They demanded of the American guards to be treated separately. At first, I was dumbfounded by their behaviour and could not think of any reasons for it. But then the others and I realised that these were men that did not consider themselves to be bound to their oath anymore. They now saw themselves as allies of the Americans, with us being their enemies. I was utterly surprised and shocked. Never before had I witnessed such behaviour. So this was how fast things could change once you were not among your own anymore. After the shocking capture and the hardships of interrogation, this was the next damper put on me. In spite of those five officers' complaints, our guards put us into a single shared train car. This, however, was now unacceptable for our own group. Several of us started complaining loudly, not wanting to be locked into a carriage with the deserters. Among our American guard crew, there were also several black soldiers, some of whom held NCO ranks. They saw the unrest in our group and came closer. One of us quickly explained the situation to them. The American NCOs reacted without hesitation. Without any further discussion, our two groups were assigned separate train cars. We were quite surprised that our wish had been granted immediately, and indeed this would not be the last time that black soldiers would display a commendable willingness to help towards me and others. The reason for that may perhaps be found in the racial segregation prevalent in the US at the time. Black Americans, marginalised by the white majority, 
apparently had a much more compassionate approach to our situation thanks to their own history of oppression. Any black US soldiers we encountered over the course of our entire war captivity would always conduct themselves humanely without exception. The cargo carriage was completely empty, so we sat down on its floor and leaned against the wooden walls. The doors were slid shut and locked, and the train slowly began moving. Due to the airstream, any warmth left inside was soon blown out, and we were freezing bitterly. There were multiple stops, always after several hours. Buckets of water were then passed up by our guards, but no food. Through the barred windows we could see how the five cooperative officers were allowed to stretch their legs during these stops, all the while happily chatting with their guards. During one of these stops, our guards, apparently on behalf of the other officers, used white paint to mark our train car in some way. This led to rocks being thrown at our carriage by French civilians on the following stops between St. Loup and Marseille. We were stunned and confused. In one railroad station, a train with French soldiers inside halted on the neighbouring track, and when they readied their weapons and pointed them at us, we felt incredibly uneasy. After three days inside the train car, with no food and forced to relieve ourselves in the corner, we arrived at the French port city of Marseille. Here we were told to detrain, and we could finally see what had been painted on our carriage. In huge letters we read the words, German officers, written in both German and French. Resentful and outraged, we could only acknowledge it. I could not understand how anyone could behave in such an unworthy manner. At Marseille, we were at first brought to another huge prison camp outside the city. This was again barely more than an empty open field. In the ice-cold night, we were again freezing. I regretted not having worn an overcoat during my capture. I could have made great use of it. It was obvious that the Americans either had not been prepared for such a large number of prisoners, or that they wanted to let us know that we were the losers of this war. The following three days were marked by privation and cold, but at the least we were given food again. On the third day we were marched back into the city in groups. Everyone was happy to leave the camp behind. On October 12, 1944, we were loaded on an American Liberty cargo ship in the port of Marseille. Our group of officers went on board with several hundred other prisoners of war. Inside, we were briefed by one of the ship's officers on the rules of conduct during the journey. A translator put them into German words. In case we broke these rules, we were threatened with harsh and draconian punishments, including being put under arrest in the ship's lower decks. In that case, there would have been no chance to get out during a submarine attack. An audible murmur went through the crowd as we heard that. Apart from these rules, we were allowed to roam the ship freely, albeit always under the watchful eyes of our guards. For the nights, we were assigned quarters with hammocks, and there was sufficient food prepared at a fixed schedule. On October 13th, we left port, and after three days on the Mediterranean Sea, we arrived at the port of Oran, Algeria, on the North African coast. Once again, I found myself in Africa, albeit under entirely different circumstances. We were not allowed to leave the ship, but could still move freely on deck. As such, we assessed that there was a large convoy being assembled here to cross the Atlantic and reach America. When this assumption was later confirmed to be correct, I was depressed. Up to that point, I had not had any opportunity to send my loved ones any message, and the distance between us and Europe was only increasing. I was sure that back at home everyone was in great distress, if they even knew anything about what had happened to me. After five days in the port of Oran, we left harbour on October 21st, 1944, early in the morning, going on a course towards the Atlantic. So I was indeed going to America. The very country whose entry into the war had proven so fatal for us. On our passage through the Strait of Gibraltar, I was amazed by how long the coast could be seen from the ship. It remained clearly visible from early in the morning until late afternoon, long after we had crossed. After passing the strait, our convoy was joined by additional vessels, until the sea around us was eventually littered with a variety of ships. Standing at the railing, we all were smitten with amazement. 
Within sight from our ship alone, I counted over 30 cargo vessels of varying types, with more individual destroyer escorts strewn in between them. Our group of officers had stayed together after the train ride, and the five officers that had separated themselves in the beginning had also come aboard with us. Now, during the first few days of the Atlantic crossing, they repeatedly tried to make conversation with the American ship officers. The latter were somewhat astounded by these attempts, not necessarily accepting them in a favourable way. The atmosphere had been quite tense after the Americans had given their harsh instructions. They could see that the German prisoners of war were not feeling at ease. Something was in the air. So it was time for the Americans to act. They did not contact the five other officers, however. Instead, they came to us. The ship's captain assembled our group and openly asked what the deal with these five officers was. According to the captain, they had come to him with the notion that we were causing problems and fomenting unrest among the prisoners. We were outraged and explained the details of how our current group composition had come to be to the Americans. The captain, who hailed from Alsace-Lorraine and spoke German, made us understand that a split into opposing groups would not be tolerated, and that discipline aboard had to be upheld at any cost. Our highest-ranking officer, a major, now proposed making us prisoners responsible for order and discipline among ourselves. Nevertheless, the five other officers were to be segregated, and the rules of the Geneva Convention were to be upheld. The Americans agreed, and as such we prisoners of war took command of ourselves. The Major saw to it that our agreement was announced to all prisoners aboard. Among the German NCOs and lower ranks were some very talented artisans, and our very next measure was to organise several improvised theatre plays. For these we used a large empty cargo bay in the ship's belly which the Americans placed at our disposal. There were vocal performances, shows of magic tricks, and even acrobatic interludes. All were quite delighted by these shows, as there was now something to do, even if it was just watching something. Thanks to these performances, we managed to keep boredom at bay for all the weeks of crossing the Atlantic. Even some of the American crew were watching our shows, and the captain expressed his appreciation for organising them. The Americans had achieved their goal, and the five other officers could not be seen for the entire rest of our voyage. That was only fair to us, and we soon forgot about them. After a few days on the Atlantic, we encountered one of the October storms typical for this season, which eventually grew into a hurricane. Most of us were landlubbers like me, and we thought that the world was coming to an end. We could not go on deck, and upon looking out of a porthole, I sometimes could not tell where up and down was. Fortunately, I did not become seasick, but our mood worsened to a new low. Like a piece of cork, our ship tumbled between gigantic waves. Then, from one day to the next, the hurricane was gone. We crowded on deck and enjoyed the fresh air. Standing at the railing, we spotted another convoy slowly coming into sight. We counted over a hundred ships that passed us heading for Europe. Oh, poor Germany, I exclaimed, saying aloud what perhaps all of us were thinking at the sight of this display of overwhelming superiority. The fact that we were coming closer to the American mainland was becoming noticeable by the crew starting to throw boxes full of supplies overboard. When we asked why they were doing this, they replied that the ship was to be resupplied in full after its arrival. As such, any old supplies left would not be needed any more. We were puzzled. None of us had expected something like that. Once again we were confronted by the abundance in which the Americans lived their lives. What a contrast to what we had to live through. I became more and more aware of what enormous amounts of resources of the Allies, and most of all the Americans, had to have available. How could a war be won against such an economic powerhouse? Oh, poor Germany, I again whispered, lost in thoughts. Chapter 20. Prisoner of War On November 6, 1944, we reached America's east coast and entered the harbour of New York. On that same day, Western Allied troops in the Netherlands stood east of the town of Nijmegen, and with Aachen, the first major German city had been captured. 
Further east in the huge woodlands west of the Ruhr River, however, November 6th saw the most intense fighting. The battle for Hürtgen Forest there would grow into the largest ground battle for American forces on German soil. On the Eastern Front, the Red Army was preparing for the assault on Warsaw and Budapest in early November. Of all this struggle along Europe's front lines, we did not learn anything, however. We all stood at the railing of our ship, gazing at the Statue of Liberty and the Manhattan skyline. The former, which just seemed gigantic to us, left an especially deep impression. When some American seamen noticed our amazement, they laughed and remarked that there would not be much liberty for us POWs in the foreseeable future. We had to contritely acknowledge that they were quite right. Now we had to hand over everything we had treasured up from supply and food crates during our journey. All we were left with was our uniforms, a duffel bag with a blanket and additional clothing, as well as any personal items we were carrying on ourselves. The ship docked at a harbour mole and we went ashore over the gangway. As we walked out, we were greeted by a crowd of curious American civilians. With much interest, they watched us falling in lines and being counted. Suddenly, a man from the crowd shouted at us in German, How are the Panthers doing? How are the Tigers doing? We had to smirk, but remained silent and wavered at him in a friendly manner. We were marched into a great hall, where we had to take off our clothes and take a shower. Then we were examined by a doctor and received new clothes. Black trousers, a light coloured shirt with the old uniform getting shoved into the duffler bag. After that, we were again registered and divided into new groups right after. Us officers were also reorganised, but this time we were separated immediately. Our group of around 15 men and the clique of five renegade officers. From now on, each of the different groups of POWs was to be relocated separately. Our group of officers, along with some guards, marched right through the middle of busy New York City to a public subway station. Everything was new to us, and with much astonishment, we looked at our surroundings, which to us were unusual and, most of all, colourful. The inhabitants of New York registered our presence more or less casually, mostly occupied with their daily business and hurrying past us. At the station, we boarded a subway train that took us across the Hudson River. I would have never imagined to one day be riding the New York subway. We kept going under Manhattan until we arrived at a railway station from where trains were departing westwards. Here, we were loaded into large Pullman carriages and sent off into the west. What now followed was a multiple day-long train ride over a distance of almost 1,550 miles. Inside the train, we learned from our guards that our destination was Alva, Oklahoma. If the United States were to have a central point, it would be around there. The town of Alva was around 90 miles northwest of Oklahoma City, the state's capital. And we were told something else. We were to stay in a Nazi camp. I was puzzled. We are to be sent to a Nazi camp, I thought exasperatedly. Back at home, and especially at the front lines, I had never bothered with politics. Today, this could be the grounds for accusations against me. Back then, however, I viewed myself to be a soldier first and officer second, and as such, I had a duty to serve our people. With that, any questions regarding politics were answered from my point of view. I bore the responsibility for the lives of all soldiers under my command and was thus obligated to facilitate their survival. After each casualty that we had suffered, I puzzled my head over how it could have been avoided. The result was that I oftentimes came to the depressing realisation that pure luck alone decided between life and death.